Well, hello there, viewers. Boy, do we have a very, very interesting interview for you today. We have two very special guests in the studio. I'd like to introduce you to Mike Vickers and Alan Saunders. Hi. All right. They're both from Cross the Nations and they have fantastic story to tell us. They have fantastic testimony to tell us. So, guys, tell me a little bit about yourself. What is Cross the Nations? I think you should answer that question. Okay. Well, um, Cross the Nations is an evangelistic ministry um, and uh, we take a 12-foot wooden cross literally across the nations and we uh, have many opportunities to share the gospel with people, to pray with people, pray for the sick um, and uh, see people come into faith wow. as well as the whole physical uh, challenge of it which attracts oftentimes guys to come and ask the question what you know why are you doing this um, you know what's the point of it and what answer do you give them if you obviously you're walking through the, the local high street with a big cross people are coming to you why are you doing this what do you say well sometimes we say i can't get a proper job <laughs> <laughs> or i'm just delivering this cross to the church <laughs> down the road and, and we have a bit of a laugh with people but um seriously obviously we're doing it it's a world recognized symbol of the christian faith and mm. uh, as we walk with the cross often people are, whatever their background, whatever their beliefs, they recognise it as a symbol for Christianity. They recognise, obviously, that Jesus died on a cross. Yeah. And for us, it's just given us an opportunity to share the message of Jesus Christ, that he loves us, that he's paid a price for our sin, and he wants to forgive us and have a relationship with God. Wow. Um, you're coming across many your non-Christians or people that are simply just curious to say, why are you doing this? What would be the first thing that you would tell them? Um, what would be the best opener for them, so to speak? Well, I, I think um, if, if we don't sort of come out with a humorous uh, comment, uh, we might say something like, look, um, we're walking with this 12 foot wooden cross because we want to tell people that God loves them and that he has an amazing plan for their life. And uh, there's a message that comes with the cross. And if you've got a moment, we'll just tell you what that is. Mm -hmm. uh, we also carry gospel tracts uh, their, their track's called Four Reasons to Smile. Very, very simple evangelistic track that says God loves you, Jesus died for you, he has a plan for your life, and today is the day for salvation. It's a gospel track that was written by a man called Eric Castro, who also walks with a cross. He's an American guy. Um, Excellent. So we're, that's probably how it would start. Yeah, I mean, I've been speaking to you before we uh, before we started recording, Mike and uh, Mike and Alan, and you're very humorous. You've got a fantastic sense of humour as well. I guess you need a sense of humour, especially when you're walking around the streets with this large cross on yeah, you. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, we do. I mean, people. The the most common comment we hear is Jesus never had a wheel. <laughs> yeah, if we had a pound for every time we heard that, we'd be very wealthy, wouldn't we? <laughs> I mean, tell us about your personality. How has your personality developed? I mean, were you always very confident? Were you very hmm. outspoken? Because <laughs> you surely need some sort of um, a strong personality to do what you're doing. Yeah, I, I, I mean, you know, it sounds crazy, but I would say that I'm by natural nature um, uh, extremely shy. If my wife was here, she would tell you that if she took me on a works do, and I, I would want to stand in the corner and not talk to anybody. So for me to do this um, is a massive step out of my comfort zone. But I guess, you know, for God to give me a 12 foot wooden cross and say, here, go walk through the nation and blend in with this if you can, is, is, is a crazy thing. But yeah. it's like that unreasonable request that often God makes. It's our obedience to it that we find out who we really are. God teases the new creation out of us when we obey him. And so when I walk with the cross, you know, I, I, I become like an extrovert. I, I take on this, not persona, but, but I, you know, I, I'm obviously stepping into the God's enabling of his grace. And, and, you know, I do. I kind of, my personality completely changes. And I'm not afraid to go up to people and talk to people and start a conversation. And you're doing this all on faith as well. You're, you're, you're traveling the world. You're, co you're covering so many different countries. You visit over 20 nations. And you sometimes travel to these nations with no money, no plans, no accommodation planned, hmm. no food. How do you survive? Tell us. <laughs> well, it's very interesting. We, I mean, we've done lots of walks. I mean, although we've done 20 nations, we've done many more walks than that. We've done many in the UK. But what's really interesting is that um, in Luke chapter 10, Jesus sent out the disciples two by two. And he said, don't take a purse with you. 
So Mike was struck by that a few years ago and we thought, OK, that's something that we'll do. And what we've learned and what God has said to us is, if you will trust me completely, then you'll see the miracles. You, you know, your, your faith will increase and you'll see more amazing things. And so not only does God provide for us, um, sometimes it's just the basics, sometimes it's well over and above what we could ever ask or imagine. Um, but what that does is it, it's increased our faith so that when we're talking to people and when we're praying for people, we are prepared to believe God for things that you probably wouldn't ordinarily do if you just sat at home hmm. not engaged with the world. Give hmm. us some examples of what you've gone through, um, arriving in different nations. No plans have been made. You don't know where you're going to be sleeping that, that night. You don't know where the next food is going to come from. Give us some examples of what you've gone through. Well, um, usually, even though we don't have plans for the whole trip, um, invariably we'll have a church that will help us get started. So someone will pick us up from the airport that will probably minister at the church on the first day and then we'll set off on God's good humour for the rest of the time. Um, so, yeah, I, oftentimes we will meet people um, and have an opportunity to minister to people along the way and someone might say to us, um, so where are you sleeping tonight then? So and we love, obviously, that question. Because yeah. we'll say, um, well, it's a bit early yet. We haven't got any plans yet. And, and you know, it, the conversation might lead to the fact, well, you can come and stay with us. Now, oftentimes we'll stay in a non-Christian household, which is fantastic because that's exactly, uh, obviously, why we do this. Um, I ended up staying in, with a, a guy in Albania who was connected to the Mafia wow. that took me off the road at a particular point because he knew I was about to walk into a... Uh, shall we say, a, 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 a religious area where lots of foreigners had gone missing. Wow. And uh, he literally took me into his house um, and uh, fed me, looked after me, and um, put me on the road the next day. But that wasn't until his whole family had given their lives to Christ in the morning before I left. So that's the kind of thing that can happen. That's um, incredible. Yeah. Alan, do you have any examples of some amazing stories that you've experienced? Yeah, uh, loads of stories. I mean, in, in terms of um, people coming to faith in Christ, I think one of the funniest stories we, we ever had was that we were walking through Poland and uh, we didn't really pay much attention to it at the time, but a guy, a truck driver, tried to run us off the road in his truck <laughs> and Mike actually pushed me into the grass verge because he thought the guy would hit us. And Mike could see his face, he was grinding his teeth, he was furious. Um, anyway, we didn't think any more about that. And then uh, six months later, I was walking solo on my own from Manchester to London and I was on the A6 outside of Leicester, going towards Leicester. It was a long story, I'd been delayed. But a truck pulled over in a lay-by in front of me. A guy jumped out, shouting and swearing at me, saying, why are you following me? It turns out it's the same lorry driver. So I, I, I said, first of all, I, I didn't realise that. I said, I'm not following you. And he said, yes, you are, you're following me. I said, no, 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 I'm going about three miles an hour. You're going 60 miles an hour. There is no way on earth I can be following you. He said, no, 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 you're following me. And I said, you'll have to explain. So he told the story about how he'd seen these uh -huh. two guys in Poland. Yeah. And he said, it was you, wasn't it? And I said, yes. Yes, it was. <laughs> so I said to, then said to him, so why are you so angry? He said, well, God has ruined my life. And to cut a, a, a long story very short, what had happened was he was living with his girlfriend. His girlfriend had gone to church. She'd given her life to Jesus. And after about two or three weeks, she said, we can't live together like this. She said, you need to give your life to Jesus. <laughs> and we need to get married and do things properly. And he was like, well, I just want to live my life how you know, it's always been. Why do we need a piece of paper? And, but she was very clear. You know, she felt she wanted to live a life that, that honoured God. And she said, if, if you can't do that, I'll have to move out. So she moved out. So he said, you know, God has ruined my whole life. Hmm. And um, I said, well, now I understand why you're so angry. Yeah. So I said, but look, let's look at it from another perspective. I said, first of all, God's clearly speaking to you. I said, the fact that, first of all, your girlfriend gave her life to Jesus and her life was so transformed and changed is an amazing thing. And she's clearly a woman of integrity. 
you know, she's got a good character and, you know, that's something to be cherished and something that's really worthwhile. I said, secondly, you see these two guys at a cross and it stirs something in your heart, you know, an anger, a strong emotion. And I said, and then you meet the same person on the other side of Europe six months later. Wow. I said, I'm not following you, the Holy Spirit's following you. And he looked at me and he kind of reluctantly, he said, well, from what you're, and he'd been quite aggressive with me. And then he, I, I said to him, so what are you going to do? And he said, well, it looks like you're giving me no choice. I said, I'm not. <laughs> yeah. You have to give your life to Christ. And it seemed like it was really reluctant, but hmm. the guy prayed with me in Polish at the side of the A6 on a dual carriageway, gave his life to Jesus Christ, and then I never saw him again. Anyway, about three weeks later, he contacted me via Facebook. And he said, I'm Yaroslav, do you remember me? And I said, yeah, yeah. He said, I've started to go to church back in Poland. Anyway, a year and a half after that, he got engaged and he married the girl. Wow. And so they're living together now as a Christian family in, mm. a, in a life that honours God. And yeah. I think that's great. Brilliant. So I just happened to be in the right place at the right time. It wasn't that I'm anything it's a God special. Incidence. It's a God incident. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. And, and to be honest, I think his girlfriend's witness was much more powerful mm. than my personal witness because she, she was prepared to lose someone yeah, that she yeah, loved yeah. very much to do the right thing by God. I can only imagine you traveling since 2008, visiting over 20 countries, you must have so many stories and you must have, your faith must have been increasing, increasing for everything that you've experienced in your life as well. For someone right now who's watching, our, watching this interview today, they might be struggling with their faith. What, would, what sort of advice would you give to them? I'd like to say that we always feel like we're in faith all the time. It's, it's, it's much more gritty than that. Uh, I was walking in St. Lucia and um, um, I was walking with two lads from Operation Mobilization. The uh, Logos Hope ship had come into Candorous and docked there. And they asked me if I'd walk across St. Lucia with two lads and I did. And we walked into a fishing bay called Air, but I hadn't noticed that some guys had got up outside their shacks, they were gambling and smoking, and it followed me down into the fishing bay. And they were shouting, blasphemer, and, and like a mob chasing me down into the fishing bay. So when I got down to the bottom, uh, they kind of surrounded me, and these two young missionary guys were outside of the, the circle, and it was getting a bit out of control, and uh, it was getting a bit, at that point where I was thinking, I need to do something here. And then one of the guys said, I'm gonna get a hammer and nails, we're gonna put you on the cross. Wow. And I was thinking, you're joking, this, this isn't happening. But two minutes later, he came back with a bag with a hammer and nails in it. And uh, they were pushing in on me. And I'm, I'm thinking, I need to say something. I need to do something. And just at that moment, the only way I can describe what happened next is if um, a, a, a machine, a noisy machine, was unplugged at the wall and it just calmed down. Wow. And everybody at the same time turned around and walked up the hill. And the two young missionary guys had witnessed this, came running over and said, what did you say? What did you say? I said, I didn't say anything. I didn't say anything. I'd like to, say to, I'd like to have said to them, you know, I, I took authority in the name of Jesus, <laughs> but that wasn't the case. Wow. When I got back to the ship, I was able to contact my wife. And when she heard me on the other end of the phone, she said, wait a minute, before you say a word, what happened at 5 p.m. on Wednesday? thing is it didn't mean anything to me at that time not not that I'd forgotten that incident sure but 5 p.m. didn't mean anything to me I said why what what do you mean she said well she said Bethany which is my daughter of seven at the time come running down the stairs saying mummy mummy daddy's being bullied wow. and we need to pray for him and my wife said wait a minute what do you mean dad's being bullied she said dad's being bullied and we need to pray for him so my wife said well who told you dad's being bullied she said an angel told me no, Jesus said, don't look down on these little ones, for their angel was before my father's face in heaven. That's incredible. And so my wife called the rest of my kids together, two boys, and they prayed, Lord, wherever dad is, just protect him in Jesus' name. Powerful. And um, then the penny dropped. I realized that as I walked in at 12 noon into that fishing bay where these guys surrounded me, it was exactly five hours difference, UK, St. Lucia. It was exactly at the moment that my daughter came come running down the stairs. Wow. So, you know, God's really looked after us. 
we've been in some sticky moments. Yeah. It's not all been a laugh. Yeah. Uh, it's been quite, you know, we've looked maybe look cool, calm and collective on the surface, but sure. underneath we've been peddling like mad. T yeah. Uh, tell us a little bit about your family. What is your f family's reaction to this? Obviously, are they concerned? Are they worried? Are they supportive? Tell us a little bit about your family. Do you want to... Oh, yeah. Um, our families are, are, are super supportive. I mean, they release us to go and um, they're very supportive in that way. And obviously they pray for us uh, back home. Uh, one of my daughters actually does technical backup sometimes when we're on the road. She's a university student, but she just helps us out in, in one way or another. Sometimes uh, our wives, I think, because they're more aware of what's going on, sometimes they are concerned. Sometimes we do find ourselves in sticky situations. They know the reality. They might know that you're actually somewhere and you've got no money and nowhere to stay. And they're thinking, OK, what happens now? Do you know what I mean? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you, I'm sure without the support from your family, you wouldn't have the peace of mind. You wouldn't be able to do what you're doing and changing so many lives and changing so many lives of the people that you meet every day That's as well. Right. That's right. How often do you do this? Is it you're, you're visiting so many nations? Um, you're in Spain at the moment. You've just arrived last night. How often do you do this? Well, it, for me, I would say probably about three, maybe four times a year. Alan does it more than me. Um, I'm pastoring a church up in the northwest of England as well. Uh, which keeps me just a bit busy. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's the amount of times I do it. But you do it a little bit more than that, yeah, don't you? Yeah, I go about five times a year. Yeah. Excellent. So you've got a website, crossthenations.com. Um, Tell us a little bit about that. Can our viewers find more information about you guys? Yeah, they should be able to find all the stories. Um, we could keep you till tomorrow and beyond uh, with stories. But they'll find stories and, uh, uh, of just how, you know, we, we laugh about the fact that, you know, we, we, we probably get more done by accident than on purpose. And, uh, you know, with our banter and our humour and we get things wrong, we lose the bolts to the cross and find out that, you know, our delay meant we bumped into somebody that was going to find Christ two hours later that we wouldn't have bumped into. You know, we, we, it's a crazy time. But they'll find all the stories, the funny ones, the, the crazy ones, the amazing ones. Um, and also what pastors have said about us as we've ministered in churches. Because the other thing that we love to do is to, to be used by God to just go in and impart faith to a congregation. And through stories of miracles and God's provision, uh, there's an activation for churches to move into another level of breakthrough for fruitfulness for their own localities. Fantastic. Yeah. Mike, Alan, it's been a very powerful interview, very powerful testimony. I just want to say thank you so much indeed for joining us today on today's programme. And I want to say thank you to our viewers as well. Thank you for joining us. If you want to know further information, then please do log on to their website, crossthenations.com. Thank you for joining us. Take care and God bless.